Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. Good to be together as we come to this Palm Sunday, the start of the great celebration leading up to Easter. And uh, today, as we remember Jesus riding into Jerusalem, been hailed by the crowds, waving palm branches, and we have these wonderful palm fronds that Tony, uh, Tony, do you go by Wentworth now? Yes, Tony Wentworth, just recently married, uh, it has given to us. Uh, we have an abundance of them, and isn't it wonderful? So we come to celebrate the, uh, the fact that Jesus is king, he's prophet, he's priest, and he is God. So welcome, and it's lovely to see uh, Anne back in commission again after a couple of <laughs> Anne and Rob back here. So feeling somewhat better? Good? Okay. And also Torben's uh, had an arm operation and uh, has managed to get out and uh, get here. So good results so far, I guess. So that's good. So let's stand and we'll sing our first song, Amazing Grace. This is Amazing Grace. Who brings the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King of all kings. Who shakes the We stand before the throne of God with countless crowds from every nation and race, tribe and language. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour, power and might be to our God forever. Amen. Would you like to be seated? 
God said, if my people will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. So let us turn away from sin and turn to the Lord, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We have not always worshipped God our Father. Lord, have mercy. Christ. We have not always followed Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We have not always trusted in the Holy Spirit, our guide. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of his Spirit all of our days. Amen. Would you like to stand for the peace? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So let's greet those around about us saying, peace be with you. Okay. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And also with you. Jenny, peace be with you. Hazel, peace be with you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Been nice to see your father and mother here. Yeah, I thought they were coming today. I wonder what's happened. Okay, shall we take our seats? And we come to birthdays, and we have two on the list today. We've got Jill Cranch and Jed Fowler. I don't see Jed around, but I do see Jill. Jill? Anyone else with a birthday this week? No? Jill, it's all for you. (laughs) Birthday greetings today. May God bless you, we pray. Live for Jesus, dear Jill. May he guide you each day. A happy day to you. Now, is there anything that you want to, we'll just, we'll just stay on the uh, celebrations for a moment. Anything you want to give testimony to uh, of what God's been up to in your life? You want to come? You, you come on now. That's okay. Good morning, all. Okay. So, just a quick update um, for those of you wondering why I'm wearing so funky. Um, So, for those of you who were not here last Saturday, um, a group of us from this parish did a um, adventure between Milford to Devonport, and then we crossed the ferry from downtown and walked up to Auckland City Mission in the effort to help raise some funds for them. So, as of last week, if you were with us, uh, we raised. $800, $800, and then we say if anyone still wanting to donate, you still can. And uh, I've just checked this morning, we've now got up to $1,203. So thank you very much for your extremely generous contribution for, for, and for those extremely adventurous uh, souls that have joined us for this 16-kilometer uh, walk. So thank you. So did Lucas reach his target? Well, I think $1,000 was mentioned as a target overall, wasn't it? So, well done, well done you guys, and uh, well done everybody else as they contributed. Torben, you, the fact you're sitting in the front suggests to me you want to come up and say something? Good? Thank you. I, I thought, well, you can all see I've got this black thing on, which is holding my arm in place because it's not allowed to move. And that's because I've just had an operation. Um, so in these things, I've always had the attitude that the things that we can do, we do, and the things that we can't do, God does behind the scenes. And I sort of said that to my surgeon that, you know, because he said to me, this is very unlikely that this operation will succeed. And when he, when he came out of the operation, he said, I can't believe it, but you, you've got all, all your tendons. So what they had to do was they, my tendons had completely dislodged from my shoulder. 
and they had to be pulled out by four centimetres, which seems to me quite a lot, and then to be reattached and re-sewn and cross-sewn, and then I also had lost the, the use of my biceps, and that also had to be sewn. So it was quite an operation, and if it hadn't succeeded, I would have had a bionic arm. That was the second option, and I don't really want one of those, because although they sound wonderful, they're very restrictive. So really, your prayers now are for Guinea, because she's having to look after me, and I'm not a very good patient. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I've got to be like this for the next six weeks, so you'll have to pray for me too that I'm patient. So thank you all very much. And God bless God for the things he did behind the scenes to make that operation possible. That's really what I wanted to say. Thank Amen. you, Manny. Father, we do thank you for the success of that operation. Uh, Lord, you're all wonderful. We don't understand your ways, how you do these things, but we rejoice in the good outcome. Thank you, Father. Amen. Anne. Similarly, a huge thank you. I'm wearing this still just because I haven't been to the hand clinic yet because we got COVID when we came back from our trip. So the huge thank you to the Lord for bringing us through that. Energy levels are still a bit down, which mm. is understandable. So we will be here for as long as we can kind of cope with this morning. But but it's wonderful to be here, and we want to say a huge thank you for all the multitude of kindnesses that different people among you have shown and all the prayer support. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Well, well done, both of you. We haven't finished yet. <laughs> here comes Rob. As Anne come, has made, come near the microphone. As Anne has mentioned, um, we've had COVID. We think we're over, but we've been cautious. But one of the sadnesses of um, having COVID was we decided that we couldn't go to listen to our great niece and her friend playing a concert. <coughs> so we were sad. And we chatted to them on the phone. And they'd been up to Wangatiao to give a concert up there. And coming back down, surprise, surprise, they knocked on our door and gave us a concert. While we sat at the front door, sat at the door, and they stood by their car and sang and played for us. And it was just brilliant. So we're very lucky, and particularly as they were travelling a good deal of distance and they still had the Auckland rush hour traffic to cope with. So we we're so grateful for a gift from, from uh, Emily and Hyun. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's stand and give our praise to God as we sing Holy is the Lord.
Would you like to be seated? And as Don comes to bring us the first reading, the children will go out to their program and say, Lord, we ask you to bless the children as they learn and their leaders as they learn with them. Amen. Our one reading this morning, other than the gospel reading, is from Psalm 118. And as you listen to it, I recommend that you have in mind the events of Good Friday and Jesus' entry to Jerusalem and see how much of that was fulfilled or prefigured in Psalms such as this. 118, beginning at page 593. First two verses and then to verse 19. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Verse 19. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. And would you stand for the gospel? The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, beginning at the first verse. Praise and glory to God. And as you see, that's on page 956. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, 
They were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. And he left them and went out to the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Who is this man? Who is this man? That is what the crowd said as Jesus came into the city. And it's a good question. Who is this man? Through the three years of his ministry, Jesus generally did not say who he was. In fact, he seemed deliberately to keep it hidden. But as he got to the end of his ministry, and here we're talking about the Sunday before the crucifixion, the triumphal entry, he's less than a week away from the climax in terms of his earthly ministry. Now he's actually making a claim. Now he is disclosing publicly, if we have eyes to see and if we know the implications of his actions. He normally walked everywhere, but this time he chose to riot. Why? Well, it was to make a claim, and it fulfilled a prophecy. Matthew is always very keen to make sure we realize that prophecies have been fulfilled in his gospel. And so he quotes here in verse 5 from the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But actually that's a combination of two separate Old Testament prophecies. You see, the words, Say to the daughter of Zion, occur only once, and that's in Isaiah 62. The verse reads, The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your Saviour comes. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Now, when we realise that the Hebrew word for Saviour is Yesha, and the name of Jesus in Hebrew is actually Yeshua, David Stern points out in the Jewish New Testament commentary that this is actually the same word. He regards the, the U in English, the U in there, as, as, as unimportant in terms of any difference. And so he's saying that actually, Isaiah is saying, see your Jesus comes, your saviour. Jesus means God saves. And he's saying salvation, David Stern, this, this messianic Jew, says salvation is a person not a thing, and not just any person, but inherently salvation has to be God, since no person can give salvation except God. So Matthew's taken a bit of Isaiah 62 and combined it with Zechariah 9, which is what we normally think of as the quote from Ben, and says in in Zechariah, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey. So it is a king who comes, but it's also salvation who comes, and therefore it is God, all in the same person. Now we we all know that they broke branches off palm trees, and we have all these wonderful palm fronds around us to remind us of that. And they waved them in celebration and they put them on the ground in front of the the donkeys so that Jesus would have this padded pathway. They put their cloaks over the donkeys, mother and young donkey. And Jesus sat on that young donkey on their cloaks. And this was a standard practice for an acknowledgement of royalty. We see it in 2 Kings when um, one of the many, many kings there became king, Jehu, when it was announced, a trumpet was blown and all the men put their, their cloaks on the ground and they raved branches and they said, Jehu is king. We saw the same custom in Tanzania. And I've told you about this before, but we were in the land cruiser with Bishop Given and he was coming into a village where actually he had never been before, but there was already a church there, which his evangelists had planted. 
And I've told you before that the custom in Tanzania, when you come into a village, if you are an honoured guest, as they come out, the village comes out to meet you on the outskirts, and then they walk you into the village dancing and singing in front of you. We've seen that quite a number of times. But this time was different. So watch this video and see what you see is happening. <laughs> You see, the branch has been waved. They were waving, they'd torn branches off trees and they were waving them. And also, if you notice in the bottom left here, on the, it's actually on the bonnet resting up against the windscreen, there is a kanga, which is their rectangles of cotton, which they wear, for example, like a skirt, as you see these, these two are. And they use them for all sorts of purposes. And they had thrown those over the Land Cruiser. In the vehicle with us that day was a young man called Mika, who was then at Theological College. He's now a priest, and he's now studying for a Bachelor of Theology at St. John's University in Dodoma. And we're in, in fairly regular contact. So I said to him, you remember when we were in the Land Rover, Land Cruiser, when they were waving the branches, it looked just like Jesus coming in to Jerusalem. Was it, were they thinking of that, or is it a general custom in your culture? And he came back and said, it is a general cultural custom. Non-Christian villages will do the same thing. The tearing off of branches and waving them, and the throwing of the kangas over the vehicle or in front of the guest, are a cultural way of honoring someone coming in. So here we are in East Africa, some thousands of miles away from Jerusalem, but the same practice is still carried on today. But as he pointed out, Christians are well aware of the parallel to Jesus being brought into Jerusalem. Well, they called him Son of David, which is a royal title. It's saying that he is the descendant of David, the Messiah that they've been waiting for, who would come and would rule with justice. The crowd are proclaiming him as Messiah and King. And by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, again, that is a symbol of a Jewish king. The Jewish kings rode donkeys. And it was prophesied, as we've heard, that a king would come riding on a donkey, not just on a donkey, but on a, a colt, a, a young donkey. Now, normally, kings come into cities on war horses. And if you're on a substantial war horse, you're well above everybody else. If you're fighting, you've got the advantage because you're striking down onto your enemies, on foot soldiers. And the horse itself is fairly intimidating. If you see an ordinary horse these days and you're up close to it, if, it's, uh, you know, if it rears up and it's, it's... As one girl I heard who obviously wasn't very familiar with horses waving its paws in the air. Well, horses don't have paws, they have hooves. If it's, if it's prancing and, and its hooves are going or kicking at the back, you know, it's a dangerous thing. But here we have a king who is a deliverer rather than a conqueror, a king of peace rather than a warlord. And it wasn't even that he came on a donkey, but on the foal of a donkey, on a young one. Mark and Luke make it quite clear it was the foal he rode. And that is in itself miraculous because they point out this beast had not been broken. So no one could ride it, but Jesus was able to ride it. And so by taking this weaker of the two beasts, not only fulfilling prophecy, there's a, a statement of humility and a triumphing over nature. As he rode into Jerusalem, he was consciously claiming the title of king. And the people gave him that title. Now, when he was coming into Jerusalem, we need to know a little bit of background of the events that have gone before. It's not so long before, within the week previously, that Lazarus was raised to life. And in that account of Lazarus being raised, many people came to see the risen Lazarus. And actually that provoked the chief priests and the scribes to say, he has to be killed. He is now too dangerous. 
So there were people coming in with Jerusalem from Bethany, which is where Lazarus lived. And there are people in Jerusalem who had come out to see what had gone on and gone back and now are coming out and they're joining the crowd going before, Jerusalem, before Jesus, the crowd going after Jesus, and they meet the people of Jerusalem who are wondering what's going on, and who say, well, who is this man? And they say, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. The route that Jesus followed into Jerusalem from Bethany was over the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and up the other side to the temple. So he started off here with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha live. He's come up past Bethphage, picked up the donkeys, ridden the donkey down the hill, down the slopes of Mount of Olives, and then across the, the uh, Kidron Valley and up the slope on the other side and to the temple. The eastern gate of the temple was the logical way to go in. And once again, Psalm 118 mentions opening the gate to go into the temple. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Now, according to Jewish tradition, the Messiah will enter Jerusalem from the east. And this gate has a special holiness. Legend has it that the Shekinah glory of God, the divine presence, used to appear through this gate and will come again. And in the meantime, it must be left untouched. This is based on Ezekiel seeing the glory of the Lord enter the temple through the east gate. Around 600 BC, Ezekiel had a vision of a new temple. Then the man brought me to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing eastwards, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. And there is the eastern gate, the golden gate. And you'll see it is bricked up. Well, stoned up, you might say, because they're not bricks, they're they're stones. This was done by the Arabs in 1530. They were ruling Jerusalem, and they knew that the Jews expected the Messiah to come through this gate, and so to make it impossible for Messiah to come, they bricked the gate up, and they put a cemetery in front of it saying, well, he wouldn't come through a cemetery because that would make him unclean. So we'll spike their guns, as it were. The only problem with that was that they were 1,500 years too late. (laughs) He had come through already, and the gate he came through was destroyed in 70 AD, actually. This was a rebuild subsequent to that. But the gate still stands with its openings blocked up. Ezekiel's prophecy has been fulfilled on Palm Sunday with Jesus coming and then the gate being shut up so that none may go through it. Having reached Jerusalem, what did Jesus do? Well, as we read on from verse 12, which wasn't strictly in the reading for today, but I felt we needed to extend into it, we find that he goes straight into the temple, and there he finds the money changers and the people selling cattle and so forth, and he drives them out. And he quotes several verses of scripture. I remember hearing the then vicar of Lancaster, Peter Guinness, saying of this passage that when a rabbi quotes from a passage, if he gives a short quote, he's actually meaning the whole passage, not just the bit he's quoted. And so when he says his father's house should be called a house of prayer, he's referring to Isaiah 56, which is a passage about the Gentiles being allowed to come and worship God. So when he says that, he's saying this place ought to be open for the Gentiles to come. He heals the lame and the blind who didn't have access because of their disabilities, so that they may have access. He is granting access to people. But then he also quotes, but you have made a den of robbers from Jeremiah 7. And that's a passage about judgment on Israel for not keeping the covenant. 
and warning that putting your trust in the temple is not going to get you out of the trouble that you're getting yourselves into because you disobey and you ignore the covenant. He was warning them in that phrase of the coming judgment and destruction of the temple. As he takes control of the temple courts, he's acting as a priest. In his declarations, he's been a prophet. And then, after that healing of the blind and the lame, the children are dancing around saying, copying their adults, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And the leaders don't like that. They realize, that actually, this is inappropriate for a human to receive this. And when they tell him off for that and say you should quieten those children, he says, from the lips of children you have ordained praise, quoting Psalm 8. Now that's not just a random quote from the Old Testament with the word praise in it. That particular quote is about the praise being offered to God. And if he says it's appropriate for them to be saying those things and he uses that text to justify it, he is saying that he is God. You see, people say Jesus never said, I'm God. No, he didn't say it in those words. He just said it over and over again through inference with things that if you were a Jew, you could not mistake what he meant. So in this one day, in this account that we've heard, he is welcomed as Messiah, as King, as Prophet. He asserts the right of Gentiles to worship God and he warns the Jewish leaders of potential judgment, and he claims to be God. Jesus entered Jerusalem as the king, not to establish monarchy over them, but to bring peace between God and humanity through his own death. He came to the temple not simply to restore the integrity of temple worship, but as the high priest to make the great offering of himself to open the way for all people to have access to God. And he pronounced judgment on Israel like the prophets of old, not simply to restore order, but fulfilling the Old Testament and enabling his disciples to live spirit-empowered lives as his witnesses. This was the day of publicly laying his claim to his position. It was quite a day. And this is quite a man. So the people said, who is this man? What do you make of this man, Jesus? What do you make of this man, Jesus? What's your response to this priest who offers you access to God the Father? What is your response to this prophet who calls you to walk in the power of his spirit as his witness? What is your response to this king who would rule those who will respond to him and lead them into harmony between God and man? What is your response to this God? Who is this man? He is prophet, priest, and king. He is God. And he says the response is, to follow him. I call you to follow him. Amen. So we continue from there into our prayers as we pray for the world and for the church, giving thanks to God for his goodness. Thank you, Don. Let us pray and reflect upon what we have heard the depth and the range of the issues involved at Jesus' entry to Jerusalem, the huge hinge of history that was happening at that moment. And give thanks on our own behalf that we have been brought through the witness of others and the operation of the Holy Spirit to faith in Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And let us give thanks for those tens of thousands of other Christians all around the world in every nation of the world 
who will, during this week in particular, proclaim, reflect upon, and present the kingship, the priesthood, and the kingship of Jesus, the Son of God. Dear Lord and Master, you showed the world your princely power by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Grant to us all that even as we rejoice in you as our King, we may follow you in your great humility to the cross and so may experience the glory of your victory over sin and death. Through your great name we pray. Amen. Let us prepare ourselves for the coming Holy Week, for the evenings of devotion, for the Passover meal, for the Good Friday services, and the Easter celebration. I have a prayer from the Anglican Church of the USA. God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us remember the suffering and those who have received surgery or are recovering from injury. Remembering the hospitals of this land and all the pressures upon those who work within them and the pressures on the government to decide how much to allocate to this national work of healing. A God of love and power, we come to you for those who are ill in body or mind and for those who are cast down and sad. Tell them in the midst of all their pain and anxiety that your name is love. And since you have ordained that your own will needs our cooperation, use these, our prayers, to benefit and heal those in need today. Turn our caring into their courage, our solicitude into their succour, and our faith into their will to get well, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Witnessing many of our members getting older, we had rather a parade of them this morning, actually, and... Um, Experiencing in myself the issues of ageing. I don't think we pray quite often enough for the challenges of ageing that we're all facing, even if you're young, but many of us see it more confrontingly. I pray for, pray for those who are ageing. Lord, our days are fast speeding from us. Things we meant to do are still left undone. And we sometimes feel that our usefulness is finished as the fire of life dies within us. And yet, in your mercy, it need not be so. We may still have rich years of fulfilment ahead of us if we allow our minds to be stretched and our hands to take up tasks within their strength. So, Lord, we offer you all our tomorrows. Open the new window for us and give us a fresh view of life. Open a new door and enable us to walk through it to opportunity and challenge. Lord, may we count our years not in days, but in the number of our friends and the growth of our knowledge of you. And make us thankful every day for all your goodness that surrounds us. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And then on the front of the new sheet, you'll find the prayer for today, which I think will probably come up on the screen as well. Our prayer focusing on the Palm Sunday arrival of Jesus. Together we pray. Jesus, when you rode into Jerusalem, the people waved palms with shouts of acclamation. Grant that when the shouting dies, we may still walk beside you even to the cross for the glory of your holy name. Amen. We're going to stand now to sing <clears throat> Jesus at the Centre. Come, Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing on those who have given in cash and through the bank. And we ask that this money which has been given, you'd give us wisdom to use well for the purposes of your kingdom. Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, the true and living God, through Jesus Christ. You are the source of life for all creation, and you made us in your own image. In your love for us, you sent your Son to be our Saviour. In the fullness of time, he became incarnate and suffered death on the cross. 
you raised him in triumph and exalted him in glory. Through him, you send your Holy Spirit upon your church and make us your people. And so we proclaim your glory as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. To you indeed be glory, almighty God, because on the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. When he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup. When he'd given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. With thanksgiving and hope we say, Glory to you, Lord Christ. Your death we show forth, your resurrection we proclaim, your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, loving God, recalling now Christ's death and resurrection, we ask you to accept this, our sacrifice of praise. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and our celebration, that we may be fed with the body and blood of your Son, and that we may be filled with your life and goodness. Strengthen us to do your work and to be your body in the world. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
who knows me, the man who walks with me, the man in whose hand is in life, he has the answer to life. In him is the gift of life. And he is the man in whom the world is looking. Bring life to the world. Bring life while you know me. Bring life while your hand is in life. Amen. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that word of prophecy. May we who in baptism die to sin rise again to new life and find our true place in your living body. May the new covenant sealed in your blood through us bring healing and reconciliation to this wounded world. Amen. We pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Would you be seated? I'll endeavour to transcribe those words from the recording and put them on the email that comes out later on of the service, so if you want to ponder those words that Torben brought to us. Reminder that we have the AGM today at 11.45, so you've got 35 minutes before then. Um, there will be a more substantial morning tea than usual to sustain you as we go into the AGM uh, if you haven't already got them, report booklets and financial reports and list of nominees uh, on the right-hand end of the foyer table. So you'll need to pick those up if you haven't got them ready for the meeting. This week is Holy Week. Uh, there's a full gamut of services. So Monday to Wednesday, we've got evening services at 7.30. Uh, they'll be non-Eucharistic. They won't take communion but they will be focusing on what I'm calling Windows on Redemption, which is looking at three types of Christ, that is three Old Testament uh, pictures of the work of Christ, and that is Joseph and Jonah and the brass snake, or the bronze snake. And then on, um, that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and those will be services in the chapel at 7.30. Monday, Thursday, ordinary service at 10 o'clock, then at 6 o'clock we've got the Passover meal, uh, and then on Friday, we've got the family service in the morning and the reflective Tenebrae service in the evening. Tenebrae is a service of seven readings, seven candles, and after each reading, we extinguish a candle as we count down towards the death of Christ and recall the events of the days leading up to his crucifixion. So just a bit more on the Passover meal. It's, uh, it is... The Passover is a Jewish festival. Uh, it has quite a, a formal um, well, liturgy, really, around the meal itself, as it recalls the Jewish people being freed from Egypt, the Lord's deliverance of them. The Last Supper, of course, was a Passover meal, and communion came from the Last Supper. So our communion service comes from the Passover. So what we do in a Christian Passover is... is um, 
have a slightly abbreviated form from what the Jews do, but we also make the connections uh, to Christianity, to Christ. Uh, it's a full dinner, therefore we do need to know if you're coming, if you could let us know by five o'clock today, either by the sign-up sheet which is out on the foyer table or by emailing the office. Um, that's for catering because it's a roast lamb and quite a lot more. Um, if you need help with transport, let us know and we'll try and arrange that. Uh, we want you to come at 5.45 on that Thursday, ready to start at 6 o'clock, so, because we have quite a lot to get through. It's a tremendous evening. There's uh, a photograph of the candles for Tenebrae um, as the service is starting. And as it gets darker, we just have candlelight and down to one last candle representing Christ. It's a very powerful service, a very quiet service. Hope booklets, some of you who said that you would deliver haven't yet received your booklets, so would you see me afterwards if that's the case, and I'll give them to you. And palm crosses. So we've got palm crosses, which Sylvia, not wave a hand, Sylvia, for those who don't know you. Sylvia very kindly made with a team who gathered with her, and uh, we're going to give those out now. So these are representing uh, the, the palm fronds on... on um, <coughs> Palm Sunday, but going through the week towards the crucifixion. So if I could have some helpers, Lucas, I'd love it if you'd give me a hand, and probably somebody else's, oh no, I've only got one tray. So Lucas will be fairly speedy. Perhaps one helper for Lucas as well. Elizabeth, could you come as well? That'd be great. Okay, so I'm just going to bless these before they go out. Thank you, Lucas. So Father, we thank you for these reminders of Palm Sunday, and of Holy Week and the crucifixion. And as we take them and use them in our prayer during the week and in the days beyond, we pray that you would use them to remind us of these events, to help us to ponder our praise of you and the great sacrifice you made. In Jesus' name, amen. So if Lucas, Luke, I've got another job for you, Elizabeth. So Lucas could give one to everybody, and some may have many more than one. I've also got some hope booklets and these are for everyone to have one to take away. Or if you've got an extra or two, one or two, that's fine. So if, yes, but these are for people here. Okay? So you give them out to people here. And you can get more from there as you need them. So you've got a hope booklet so you get it even if you've got a no, a no um, junk mail on your letterbox which would stop them coming to you. Because unfortunately, if it's not actually addressed to the householder, you can't put anything in such a letterbox. <laughs> Tell us about the prayer vigil. Oh, yes, sorry. Did I mess that one up? The prayer vigil is on Thursday night after Passover. It's uh, one hour slots through the night from 10 o'clock to 7 o'clock the next morning. The idea is that we maintain someone praying in here through the night. Uh, you, we'll provide you ideas of things you might pray for. And I know it sounds a bit daunting, but it's surprising how quickly the hour passes when you come here and you're quiet and you read some scriptures and you pray about them. And uh, it's, it's recording Jesus saying, could you not pray with me one hour uh, when he was in Gethsemane. So there are sign-up sheets for Passover, for prayer vigil, and for Tenebrae. At Tenebrae, we need readers. I think we've got three slots left untaken. And uh, you'll see if you'll write your name there and then take away the slip of paper with your reading on it so you can practice it. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder, Helen. Okay, I think we'll start our last song as we sing of God's glorious grace to us. And as we, as we stand and prepare to sing this song, I'd like you just to, uh, if there's anybody here who has not yet reached out their hand to take Jesus' hand in life and say, yes, I want to walk with you every day of my life. Would you be my king? I uh, invite you to do that right now because to, right now is a good time. Today is the day of salvation, says the Lord. And then we'll, you'll be able to receive from Jesus the grace that we're going to sing about now.
So Lord, as we go into Holy Week, we pray that you, by your Spirit, would lead us, and draw us close, and speak to us through the services and prayer of this week. And help us, Lord, to do as you said in your word to us, to draw in those who do not know you. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. We go in the name of Christ.